much, Deborah, and uh, thank you to the organisers of uh, today's event. Um, before I, I get into you know the whole Joseph Rowntree report that we did, I think I'd better say something about myself. There is a bit of a danger when people hear the title director of the Centre for Responsible Credit that they think policy wonk. Uh, and that would kind of be fair enough, really, were it not for the fact uh, that my history is a bit longer than that and starts at a very grassroots level, uh, working in citizens' advice, in welfare rights and in debt advice for probably about 15 years or so before I got any, anywhere near the sort of policy uh, debates and issues uh, and those kinds of jobs. I was actually thinking about it. it. The last time I was in Hull was in 1988. Uh, when I was an 18-year-old undergraduate at Warwick University doing economics and politics, and I met somebody who came to Hull in the summer holidays and we had a great time and all that sort of stuff. But uh, a year later uh, than that was the introduction in Scotland of the poll tax, uh, which then came obviously south of the border in, uh, around 1990, and I got very heavily involved in the anti-poll tax campaign, uh, which really did spark <coughs> Uh, if we're going to use Deborah's term, a sense of injustice uh, that was going on in uh, low-income communities at that time. Uh, but also uh, a real sense that when people got together, they could re make a real difference. And of course, that campaign ultimately successful in overturning the poll tax. But then beyond 1990, when I came out of university, I wanted to continue some of the work that I've been doing during that campaign, advising people about their rights on bailiffs, and what to do if they were threatened with magistrates' courts, liability orders, and things like that. And so I volunteered at Citizens Advice Bureau and indeed at the Racial Equality Council in uh, Midlands. And uh, from that, uh, fell into a career. I, I didn't really have any fixed notion as to what my career was going to be, but I fell into giving advice uh, and subsequently managed services at Redditch and indeed for Leicester City Council, commissioning of advice services and so forth. But one of the things that got me to where I am today was actually a meeting with single parents in Redditch in, I think, December 1999. And uh, they were telling me about the tremendous problems that they were having repaid debts to Provident Financial and the high cost door to door lenders. And in 2000, I was at that time active in what was then the Money Advice Association, uh, nationally doing their press work, and we ran a press campaign about the very high cost of those sorts of loans and the damage that they were doing to local communities. And uh, that was very successful in getting some national profile, and indeed brought me into contact with church groups, community groups, trade unions, who wanted to take on that issue as well. And so we founded a campaign the following year called Debt on Our Doorstep. And I chaired that campaign for, I think, around 10 years, or co-chaired it with Neil Cooper from the Church Action on Poverty. And then we continued to campaign throughout those years for caps on interest rates, for the expansion of credit unions, for more affordable credit. Uh, and that continued right through, I have to say, until the present day. And I was enormously pleased, having worked with Stella Creasy, and Paul Blomfield MPs uh, over the recent parliamentary session that we did manage to get a cap on payday lending. Uh, and that's the product of 15 years of hard work by not just me, but many other people indeed. Uh, the book that you mentioned, which I feel duty bound to wave around at things like this, and, and if my publisher's watching, you probably uh, tweet in to say thanks very much, uh, is basically that story. Um, and indeed, uh, in the context of uh, what's happened to Britain's economy over the last 30 to 40 years. Um, so, it, it is, by all accounts, depending how you, uh, how you view it, uh, either a riveting good read, uh, or um, it will certainly get you off to sleep very beautifully, uh, should you need to do that. Um, but that's, that's the book for so I think that gives me a broader perspective when I came to this work uh, for Joseph Rowntree Foundation about advice, support and its impact on poverty. It was a literature review. Um, so, you know, we were looking at what was already out there and trying to bring that evidence together in a way 
that could shape an agenda moving forwards. We weren't doing original research ourselves on, on this sort of issue, but it was quite fascinating to see, I think, that over the years, clearly advice services conscious of all the things that Deborah's uh, remarked upon already this morning, know that they make a real difference to individual people's lives, and indeed more broadly because of the concentration of poverty in local communities to those communities, but often have not demonstrated uh, how those changes are made and the impact that they're having to an extent that's been sufficient for government to realise that and indeed put money into the resourcing of it. Now there are two issues there. You can be critical about advice services for failing to demonstrate and we'll come on to that because that's a moot point. Or you can say that actually the things that uh, advice services are demonstrating, for example increased take up of benefits, are bound to fall on deaf ears with a government which is determined not to pay out so much money because of its austerity economics policies. Uh, so there is a challenge immediately within those two things and often the challenge gets put to the advice sector to say you must demonstrate yourself and do more in these areas when in fact a politically conscious decision has been taken that, it, it, that people uh, want to restrict the amount of money that's being paid out of the budget. There were some challenges uh, with the research. Uh, the first is obviously definitional. What do we mean by advice and support? What do we mean by its relationship with poverty? And what do we mean by impact? So I'll just talk you through that. It's not going to come as any great shock, I don't think, to anybody in the room. Advice and support is clearly a broad spectrum. It's a continuum from just simply providing pure advice right through to providing personal advice, support, advocacy, attending courts, uh, tribunals and other things. Um, effectively, that's an extraordinarily broad range of service, types of service provision to look at. And the impacts on poverty will, of course, vary considerably on the amount of, uh, uh, on the approach that's being taken. Um, Deborah mentioned this, and we did find this very clearly. Most of us, in fact probably all of us at some point in our lives, will need information, advice and support with something. So uh, the difference, of course, with regards to people in poverty is their propensity, the likelihood of that recurring over their lifetimes, is greater. And the extent of support required is often greater. Now, there are a couple of reasons for that. It's not just about the individual. It is about what's happened to our economy over the last 30 years. If we think about the casualisation of labour, the introduction more recently of zero hours contracts, then clearly people who are more likely to experience poverty are those in those types of insecure employment, moving in and out of work on a more regular basis. There are limits, therefore, to how far individualised advice responses, providing individuals with advice, will affect their ability to get out of that sort of cycle of in and out of work. And it's not saying that they're not important, but they need to look at perhaps some of the things which will help them progress in employment, rather than, of course, just dealing with the immediate impact of a loss of wages or uh, a move in and out of employment that that, that would bring. So, what determines the extent of support as well there are also issues to do with the individual and it is about their skills, their knowledge, the support networks that they've got, their, what we would call human and social capacity in a, a wonky sense. Uh, so, and of course advice services are very aware of those individual issues which make it more difficult for them to access services or indeed to act on the advice and information that's been given to them. So for example, advice services will be much more likely to provide advocacy and uh, very intensive support to people with the greatest needs, whilst being content to perhaps offer information or uh, tailored advice uh, to people who will have the skills and attributes uh, to be able to act on that themselves. But there are some big questions, therefore, about the role of advice uh, and its relationship with 
poverty and whether or not some of those structural issues that I mentioned need to be addressed in different ways. Uh, in terms of impacts, there are also some definitional issues here. Um, obviously, I've mentioned already a couple of areas where impact measurement takes place, and that's often in things which are actually quite easy to collect in terms of uh, benefits raised, in terms of debt dealt with, in terms of uh, evictions prevented. Those sorts of initial outputs are actually very easy to report on, and advice services have been doing the sterling job in those respects. Uh, but in terms of the impact on people in poverty, we need to be aware it's much more difficult to measure, well, did that mean that their experience of poverty was less severe? Did it mean that their experience of poverty was not as lengthy as it otherwise would have been? And those are very difficult issues to actually determine without any form of longitudinal studies, which are invariably extremely expensive and extremely time consuming. Why is advice needed? Well, to come back to Deborah's uh, point of view, we, we found three uh, major causes of the drivers for advice. The first was around <coughs> life events, and there's been a whole heap of stuff, for example, done by the Money Advice Service on how life events drive the need for financial advice, debt advice, uh, and advice on different financial products, for example, that's just one area. Uh, that we could look at. Um, but life events are effectively around household formation, uh, so when young people set up home, leave family homes. And for kids in poverty, often that is not straightforward. Uh, many are actually care leavers. Uh, many others do not get the parental support that middle class families uh, give. And so that's much more difficult. Changes in household composition uh, which is pretty clear, so we're talking births, we're talking partners, uh, and so on. And of course, it comes on to the second point around the changing nature of state support and the intrusion of the state in people's lives. If you're on benefit and you enter into a new relationship, then you are scrutinised with regards to that relationship and you'll have reporting obligations which would not apply to people who are not in receipt of benefits. So the whole thing becomes extremely much more advice uh, intensive in that uh, people on lower incomes because of these natural changes in their lives uh, actually have to deal with the state, with other agencies and therefore need advice and support on dealing with those bureaucracies. Uh, so if we were to remove the need, for example, of the state to intrude upon people's lives, whether they got into relationships or out of them, you would wipe away at a stroke the need for a whole heap of advice. Uh, so that's just one example of that. Changes in material circumstances follows the same argument, so people's incomes fluctuate, and I've talked about structural, some of the structural reasons why that is. Casualisation of labour being particularly one of them, uh, but fluid wages and contracts and all the rest of it. Um, so changes in material circumstances are likely to happen more often. And again, they're subject to scrutiny by the state in terms of the effect on benefits and other entitlements that people would have. And that gives rise to a whole heap of advice needs as well within the household. And there could be changing needs within the household themselves, within, um, you know, in terms of people becoming ill, uh, disability, uh, and so forth. So they all, again, drive the need for advice. But it is, I think, this changing nature of state support, which in recent years, um, has particularly impacted on your jobs. Um, so if we were to think about the introduction of universal credit and the payment direct of uh, the housing benefit element of that to tenants rather than landlords, social landlords, and of course that is driving a huge need for the explanation of those rules in terms of other things like benefit caps as well. Uh, it, and that, you know, does place an enormous burden on advice services at the same time at which advice services have seen their budgets cut drastically and the funding uh, from legal aid uh, uh, effectively lost in many, many areas. It's not just the state and the fact that the state has become more intrusive. It's not just that they've wholesale uh, cuts to uh, benefits. 
It's also other changes, economic and social policy decisions around housing, workers' rights, equalities legislation. These all have an impact, and any government policy change will therefore give rise to a need for advice probably centred on those who are on the lowest incomes and at risk of poverty. But it's also the operation of key markets, and I mentioned my particular obsession uh, around uh, high-cost credit. Uh, you can either call me tenacious or, as my father would say, sheer bloody minded on that point. Uh, but it is other uh, key markets as well, so we can talk about energy. Uh, things have become much more complex in terms of the expectation that people will seek out the best price, that they'll switch. Uh, and so on, and uh, these can make enormous differences to the financial well-being of households. But it is much more complex landscape than it was previously, and the onus is put on the individual to navigate through that landscape and secure the best outcomes for them. Um, and that raises all sorts of issues. And the final point, obviously, is uh, levels of human and social capital that I've mentioned. So health is a key one there, but also skills and support networks. And there was some interesting research done actually with uh, lone parents uh, of uh, low income lone parents who, whose support networks did not usually mean <coughs> that they were uh, aware of many childcare opportunities uh, and assistance that was available to them, whereas middle class parents did have extremely good uh, support networks and were able to navigate through that landscape much more easily. Um, life events and poverty, I've probably said quite a bit around this, so I'll, I'll skip through this one uh, to a degree. Uh, transitions to adulthood, I've mentioned, but also things like no bank of mum and dad, uh, lower level skills and qualifications and lower paid work when people do uh, try to establish themselves. Composition, uh, the weak bargaining position in key markets, scrutiny, lack of financial resources, I've mentioned as well, and the changes in material circumstances and needs. Uh, well, clearly, employment status, earnings, and benefit incomes are important, uh, as is providing people with long term support to access and sustain quality employment. And I think, in some respects, one of the things that came out for us from the study was how advice services could deliver advice in ways which helped people to build their own social capital, uh, human and social capital. So in other words, that empowering approach, which has often been talked about in the delivery of advice services, and there have certainly been some excellent small scale examples of that, but things like peer-to-peer -peer advice, mentoring approaches, things that build people's confidence and give them the skills to actually then use in other areas of their life, particularly in terms of uh, their ability to um, progress within the labour market. Oh. Yeah. So just to uh, talk a little bit, and these are just really some examples of things that I've said about the relationship with the state and uh, people's position in respect of key markets. Uh, firstly, changes in provision, and this is not just national, this is also local. So we can think here about the changes to, for example, the council tax support regime, which would have given rise to a huge need for advice depending on uh, what that was locally. Uh, but other local decisions around housing, uh, uh, particularly, do drive a need for advice and need to be taken account of in terms of what that demand is going to be. And the point I'm going to come on to the conclusions and recommendations later is that there's not a lot of thinking that goes on in government, national and local, about the likely demand for advice which will arise from their policy decisions. And they don't therefore put any resources into providing that advice, that additional amount of advice that directly comes from decisions that they've made. And there probably is a loud shout that needs to go back from the advice services sector to government, both local and national, about that. 
But it, this was just an example. Citizens Advice reported that 50% of its clients will be affected by the introduction of universal credit, and they did surveys and, and so forth. Nine out of ten of those will need some form of support to manage the transition. Uh, reductions in council tax support, introduction of substantial minimum payments for poorer households has resulted in a significant increase in demand for advice. These were just a couple of the findings, but you could list these in a whole heap of uh, areas uh, with regards to um, national or local policy decisions. And what's important here is the impacts of those decisions are not just likely to be financial. It's true that council tax support has a direct financial impact and people need to be advised about that and help to cope with that. But in reality, if you continue to drive down people's incomes and they're already on extraordinarily low incomes to start with, then there will be wider impacts. And Deborah mentioned health and mental health. But we can also think about child welfare and educational outcomes. We did a piece of work actually for the Children's Society which looked at the impact of debt and financial problems on children and found that uh, things that just were simply overlooked over a long period of time. If kids get evicted because their parents can't pay the rent, they have to change where they live, it affects their schooling. There's no longer a consistent approach, for example, to the delivery of the national curriculum. So it's not like you just leave one school and go to another and pick off the lessons where you started off. That's a whole different experience for people. And kids that were moving into new schools were more likely to be bullied uh, for a number of reasons as well. There's stuff there about that. So there's a whole heap of child welfare issues which just aren't taken into account when, for example, a housing association or a, um, a council or indeed private landlords evict on the basis of uh, the fact that the prior pressure on uh, people's budgets is increased by benefit cuts or uh, other things. And of course on employment as well. And uh, there's quite a lot of literature uh, with regards to the impact of debt problems on absenteeism, productivity at work, the ability to sustain employment. Which sort of brings me to this sort of point, is that this isn't going to go away. The, the driver over the last 30 years, and this is the depressing bit of the presentation, in case you weren't already aware of this, um, the driver over the last 30 years is to uh, increase, firstly, individual responsibility for their own outcomes in life, and credit markets have been used uh, to try to give people the means uh, to manage some of that. Um, but also, uh, greater insecurity of life uh, in terms of the types of employment that people are doing, in terms of casualisation, in terms of housing decisions around very uh, insecure private tenancies and in other areas. So fundamentally advice services have a choice which is to say that they can either help people cope with those really big changes that are going on, which of course they can to some degree, or maybe and or would be more accurate, really start to feed back the evidence about how those changes are destructive uh, and how those changes uh, basically increase costs for taxpayers in the areas that I've mentioned around health, employment and uh, child welfare particularly. So social policy is really important um, and probably wouldn't come as a surprise that I'm saying that as somebody who started in advice work and then ended up in policy uh, work. But, you know, there have been some really good examples of positive social policy that have made a difference and likely to have cut costs for others. And so in terms of really building on that as the, the nature of an argument for funding is what I'm getting at here, not just simply because it's the right thing to do.
uh, which it is. Um, but the, the Money Advice Trust Royal College of Psychiatrists, they developed a training program for debt recovery staff working in the credit industry. It's a really good example of social policy work uh, in order to cut the costs effectively of debt recovery, but also make it much more sensitive to the fact that people would have uh, mental health problems. Uh, 2013 Citizen Advice Board for a personal shopping service for energy customers, uh, which would require providers to share data uh, with, uh, about actual energy use so that customers could find the cheapest deals available. Again, these things not only uh, benefit the individual customers, but do also encourage greater competition in that market uh, and would therefore bring down prices for um, not just those people, not just people needing advice, but for the, the broader uh, population. Just a quick bit then on, on human and social capitals. I've already talked about a little bit. What, I, what I've probably not talked about too much is social capital, and uh, that's relationships with family and friends, presence of, in wonky terms again, other productive networks. Um, we do, one of the things we found was, we do tend, if we build groups, uh, group work approaches, to build groups of people in the same situation. Um, so it's people in poverty working in groups and building networks of other people in poverty. And actually, it would be more interesting, I think, if we were to develop mixed groups so that people in poverty had the opportunity to uh, meet and share experiences with people who were not in poverty. Uh, because they probably bring with them wider networks. <coughs> and, and that's quite challenging, I accept that. Um, but it probably gets to the core of, of what's really happening in British society in terms of some of the scapegoating of uh, benefit claims, for example, or people on low incomes by the current government, in that they want to think of people in poverty as a separate group away from the rest of society that they can blame uh, for the uh, deficit uh, and actually we need to challenge that in practice and so trying to bring yeah, trying to bring together groups of people who by their very existence challenge that notion is, uh, is an interesting way forward I think um, we basically did this sort of thing as well I'm, I'm limited for time now but we mapped through for example, some human and social capital issues, which are not going to come as any surprise to you around English skills or around physical health, the impact on the need for advice and the potential impacts of advice. So there's quite a nice framework within the report, which I'm sure you can uh, draw on in terms of some of that. And of course, you'll be aware of all of those issues anyway, because in your own plans, in regards to how you provide advice, you'll be conscious of your local community's needs and the barriers that they have uh, to access and so forth. Um, the one that I would pick out there is perhaps the structural uh, ones, uh, so things like bureaucratic procedures and all of that sort of stuff, which are really difficult and the advice services uh, sector has really fought to overcome in many respects around referrals between agencies, making sure that people actually get to where they need to go and that sort of stuff. And it backs up really the findings of the Low Commission, uh, which I'm sure Lord Low will talk about uh, later in terms of the, either the co-location or the closer integration of services to make those sorts of things easier. Uh, I won't go through that. Um, but it's basically just a typology. But when we talk about advice services, it's not just the spectrum of the way, the types of information support that they provide and the intensity of that, but it's also the fact that advice services are very different in terms of whether they're focused on specific client groups, single issue services, or a community, or whether they're co-located or embedded. And so we've got to be quite careful when we talk about advice services that we're not overlooking some of the differences between them. Um, and what I would just go on to then is the stuff on impacts really, because this is where we, we finally get to it. We think there is a, a great case for advice services to be funded more uh, effectively, to, to be resourced much better, but that that 
quite being made out. And uh, what we would say is that the advice sector has been very good at measuring the primary impacts, things like benefit take-up and so forth. It's not too bad uh, at getting some of the secondary impacts, things like improved diets, warmer homes, increased participation and confidence. But what has been lacking in terms of the advice services uh, case for funding in terms of its impact on poverty has been these longer term outcomes and actually trying to show that advice is part of a pathway out of poverty for people. Um, so, just in terms of the conclusions to finish off then, we do think advice services should be embedded uh, in other services which groups of people in poverty are most likely to use in relation to the major life events that they face. We do think government, both local and national, and indeed regulators, should consider the likely impact on the demand for advice when they're putting forward any future proposed changes to policies and administrative arrangements which are likely to affect people living in poverty. They simply don't, and maybe that's something that could be taken up with your local council as much as uh, with government. Local public sector commissioners should conduct audits to the extent of current provision provide an assessment and develop strategic plans for local provision. Probably a recommendation that's been in every report about advice services since the day we got them. Uh, some methods of advice delivery could increase levels of human and possibly social capacity, so those group work, peer-to-peer, -peer, mentoring approaches we think should be built on. Uh, future research should assess the differential impacts of advice groups on poverty who are in persistent or recurrent poverty. So in other words, there has to be some assessment as to uh, what somebody's likely progression uh, out of poverty would have been without intervention. And that is very difficult. It's going to take some <coughs> research to do that. And probably brings me to the final uh, one, which is really, if we're going to build a business case for advice, it needs to be about the social return on the investment. And unfortunately, there isn't currently a consistent approach to that at the moment. And so at the national level, the advice sector and the stakeholders, including government, need to draw up uh, a plan as to how that's going to happen. I, I really hope that I am concluding, and I'm off, don't worry. Um, I really hope that that's thrown out some food for thought. Because, as I say at the outset, it was a, an evidence review and we were quite critical about the quality of evidence. And I think that that was justified in the current climate where government doesn't want to give you any more resources. And so we were looking very heavily at what the strength of the business case would need to be in order to shift that debate forwards. It is not, however, in any way, shape or form, a failure to recognise that in your day-to-day -day jobs, advice workers make a heck of a difference, and I know it and have seen it during the course of my life in providing advice. So please don't take it as a criticism of you. It is, however, probably a critique of where we're at with current funding at the moment and how difficult it is going to be to make the case to government. Thanks very much.